Oh, I think Necro is here. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, so I'll start. Good. Yeah. Okay, so welcome all to the second part of my uh, talk on dark matter and its cosmological significance in our universe. So in the previous sections, we have looked uh, looked on uh, how uh, like what basically comprise, uh, comes under the category of dark matter, what set of objects in the universe uh, comes under the ca category of dark matter, and why they are uh, considered as dark matter. And we have also seen some ways to detect dark matter in the case of galaxies and uh, with a set of equations. And now let's move on to the, <coughs> sorry, uh, let's move on uh, further uh, into a, by expanding our uh, scale into the in the case of clusters now. So clusters are basically just the you know collection of various galaxies in a set of point, right? In a scale, in a larger scale. So the, the, now let's consider the effect or the uh, importance of dark matter in clusters. So as we know, dark matter again was coined by uh, the phys mathematical physicist uh, Fritz Wicke, who was a Swiss physicist. So he uh, actually termed it as uh, dunkle matter. So that's basically in uh, German. So it just uh, it's equivalent to dark matter, which were again re uh, you know uh, re uh, recoined by Poincaré. So that's an interesting trivia to trivia to know. And uh, yeah, so. When we consider, uh, and we have seen, as we have seen in the previous one, uh, that the velocities almost tends to remain constant, or it tends to increase in some cases as we move away from the center of the uh, center of the galaxy, right? The objects, or the uh, stars, and other uh, cel uh, celestial objects, as we move away from the center uh, of cent center of the galaxy, so the uh, velocities that tends to increase or ten it tends to remain constant in most of the cases. So now uh, let's look at uh, the clusters in which is basically so we'll instead of taking uh, uh, stars or any other celestial objects in, into consideration, we take a, a whole galaxy as such and we try to uh, understand how the galaxies interact in a cluster. So first uh, assumption is that let's consider a, a cluster which is isolated, such that no other object other than the object in the cluster can influence it. So basically, we are trying to say that the gravitation, uh, put, uh, the gravitational potential of the clusters from the uh, uh, due to the uh, objects outside the cluster is infinite, or it, it's at an infinite distance. So <clears throat> uh, yeah. So let's consider uh, one cluster, uh, one such cluster uh, in which uh, dark matter was proved to be more prominent, which is the coma cluster. It's about, uh, I think, three megaparsecond away from our galaxy. And, uh, sorry, uh, it's about, yeah, 300 megaparsecond from a, a, a distance, uh, at, at distance from our galaxy. And its uh, radius is about three megaparsecond, which is about, uh, 0.0002 times the uh, horizon distance, as we have seen in the previous sections, uh, the Hubble distance or the horizon distance. So the one uh, uh, you know crucial assumption that we have to make here to you know proceed further uh, with the derivation or the kind of set of equations that I have listed below is that. Uh, the objects in the cluster move non-relativistically, so, or it moves at a speed that is very uh, low compared to the speed of light. And uh, the yeah, so and the horizon this, or the radius of the cluster is way less than the horizon distance, as I uh, mentioned before. And uh, <clears throat> the velocity dispersion is also yeah, the velocity dispersion is way less than the speed of light. So we can consider uh, the uh, 
galaxies in the cluster to be non relativistic so we tried to uh, use the law, newtonian law, uh, newtonian uh, laws of gravitation to proceed uh, further with the, uh, in this case so first we have uh, so so let's consider there are n galaxies in the cluster and the acceleration of the ith galaxy in the cluster is given by the equation 1 which is uh, xi double dot is equal to g times sigma j is not equal to 1. So i and j. So we're considering two, uh, two a pair of galaxies that is i and the jth galaxy. So for, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, so j is not equal to because i cannot be equal to j in this case. So you have mj times uh, the xj minus xi, that is the position of the jth galaxy minus position of the ith galaxy by uh, xj minus xi all cube. So this is basically like the vectorial notation of the Newtonian uh, law of gravitation. So the gravitation potential, uh, and as you can see, so we have the gravitation equation. So the gravitation potential can be uh, devised uh, in the form as, uh, that is GMM minus GMM by R, right? So we have minus G by two times sigma of MI MJ by XI minus XJ minus XI. So the one reason why we have taken by two here is because we, when we, because here we are trying to, uh, you know, compute the gravitation, uh, gravitational potential, the energy between uh, that is from one galaxy to another, right? So, but since we are sum, we are uh, doing the summation of the, uh, you know, the i and the galaxy and all of the galaxies together, we would, do not want to, you know, count them twice when we are trying to sum over it. So that's why we use the by two factor here in this formula. That is one in, as important thing to note. And so, and yeah, and the potential energy of the cluster can also be written in the form as W is equal to minus alpha G M squared by RH, where M, this capital M is the sum of all, uh, of uh, some of the masses of all the uh, galaxies present in this, in the cluster. And uh, RH is basically the half radius, uh, sorry, yeah, half uh, distance from the center. So basically half distance is the distance from the center of the uh, galaxy to a point where the mass of the galaxy is exactly half, sorry, the mass of the galaxy is exactly half. So that is the, uh, uh, you know, uh, major uh, substitution we try to make here. And alpha is nothing but your, uh, you know, numerical factor, which is of order unity because we're only considering two galaxies at once here. So it has a unit order. And its value uh, to fit the uh, its value to fit the equation or the to satisfy the potential energy equation here is to, to be taken about uh, 0 0.4. So alpha is approximately 0 0.4 in this case, in the case of coma cluster. So proceeding further, yeah. So we have calculated. Uh, we have uh, you know come Just up with the equation. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is it a typo that you have written j not equal to one? Would it be j not equal to i? Oh, okay, right. right. Sorry, sorry. Uh, wait. In both the summations. Oh yeah, right, 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 right. Uh, not equal to i. Sorry. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's supposed to be i. So yeah, j. So just to just say that it's not. It's uh, those are distinct galaxies. Yeah. Sorry. That's, sure. Yeah. I think I'll make the correction when I post. Yeah. Okay. I am sure. I, okay. Yeah. So proceeding for since we have devised the relation for the potential energy, now we move about uh, to the kinetic energy of the uh, relative motion of the galaxies in the cluster. So that is half mv square as we have, as we know. So we have, we are summing over i galaxies. So we have <coughs> mi xi dot square. That is m xi dot is nothing but v. So half mv square. And uh, here the kinetic energy can also be written of the form. K is equal to half m into, so this is basically the uh, average velocity, the average relative velocity of the uh, galaxies in the cluster. So this is nothing but v square is nothing but xi, xi plus uh, xj and so on. xi square. Yeah, right. So, yeah. So one thing uh, to, uh, so when we try, try to talk about the rotation and, you know, rotation velocity and rotation of any object, we tend to use, uh, you know, uh, we tend to formulate it in terms of the moment of inertia since we're dealing with mass as well as, you know, rotation. So, uh, the uh, radial velocity of the galaxy. So the rotational, uh, the moment of inertia of these uh, radio, uh, these galaxies can be written as, so it is I is equal to M R M I or M I R I in this case. So we just have uh, Sigma I into M I or X I M I M R square. So yeah. And this should not be. Right. 
Okay, I think I made a mistake here too. There should not be a dot here. It's just MIXS, but I'm sorry, I uh, you know, got confused between the equation. So it's I is equals to sigma uh, I, uh, sigma, you know, sum up to I for MIXI square. It's not MIXI dot square, sorry. It's only MR square, right? So I is equal to sigma MIXI square. And, and thus, uh, <clears throat> the moment of inertia in terms of the potential and the kinetic energy. So, uh, According in the Newtonian, uh, you know, Newtonian mechanics, uh, we can represent the moment of inertia in terms of kinetic and potential energy by taking its double derivative with respect to time. So it is basically d square i by dt square. So that is nothing but when we try to double differentiate this uh, equation, we get uh, two times uh, sigma uh, summation of i mi xi into xi double dot plus xi dot into xi dot. So basically, when we try to, you know, or so you know, simplify it. We get not, we get uh, two into sigma m i into x i into x i double dot plus four times the kinetic energy. So kinetic energy we have seen here half into sigma i of m i x i dot square. So we have, sorry. So when we try to multiply this inside, this right right side term multiplied by this just gets to four times the kinetic energy. So this is uh, yeah, this is one formulation. And uh, now. Uh, one thing we will be trying to do is to get this in terms of the virial theorem. Or we will see how vir virial theorem is even applicable to the self-gravitating body, uh, self, uh, yeah, self-gravitating uh, potential bodies in the clusters. So we'll see how it, uh, virial theorem's applicability can also, you know, uh, apply get uh, be used in this case. So we have, uh, so we will try to formulate uh, formulate the uh, potential energy, which is basically the left left uh, the uh, left term in the right hand side. So you have sigma i, m i x i into x i double dot. This is where, uh, so that is nothing but uh, the uh, g into uh, sigma m i m j into x i dot. Um, this uh, huge equation. That's basically yeah. So when you try to uh, so and one thing is that when you replace i with j, so basically you have sigma of i into m i x i and so on, right? So if you if I just replace this i with j, we see that the RHS seems to be the the same, right? So you have uh, what do you say m j into x j into x i uh, x uh, double dot uh, j uh, times. So you have m uh, m i m j, which is a product. Basically, is the same, and then you have uh, xj times xi minus xj and then you have a minus uh, if you want to represent it in terms of i you have a minus here and then this cube and since you take the minus sign here it basically is the same as the uh, representation for the i galaxy for the uh, the as uh, this uh, the, the potential energy of the i galaxy is same as the potential energy for the j galaxy is what we can see from this equation so we can uh, come up with this relation and we will use this relation uh, in this, I mean, we'll use this relation and we'll uh, see that. <clears throat> so since kinetic error means, uh, uh, we'll see that this relation leads to half of, uh, so basically we are using this in, yeah, this equation. So this equation. And so we get uh, this equation number 11. So basically you see that this term, um, where is I x i double dot is equal to g by two. So this is basically the work done, right? The work done potential energy in terms. Uh, this is basically the potential energy is what we can see here. So if I send this two to the other side, it's just basically the expression for potential energy that we have seen. So we can just simply write this as uh, i uh, i double derivative is equal to two times w two plus four times k. So this is similar to yeah. This is actually the equation that is. Uh, also known as the famous virial theorem, which was used in uh, basically the kinetic theory of gases in, the, in where we can, as I think we have studied this already. So where we can see that the potential energy is equal to half times the total energy and the kinetic energy is minus per time the potential energy. So that is about it. And so uh, we are, uh, if I is equal to constant, so basically if I is constant, that means what? Uh, this, uh, then the universe is a steady state universe or the DC universe, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is what Einstein was actually going behind, you know, while accidentally dis uh, describing the cosmological constant. So interesting to see about this case. So in the steady state universe, again, I is constant, so the double derivative of I tends to become zero. And then you have W plus two K is equal to zero and K is equals to minus W by two. 
So this is again the uh, extension of the virial theorem. So using equation number uh, using equation three and five. So let's go back and have a look. Yeah, this equation and this equation. So using these two equations and we try to uh, use equation number fifteen. We come about equation number sixteen, which is half m into average of v square is equal to alpha times g m square by two times r h. So yeah. Using uh, using this, we can calculate the mass of the cluster basically. So when we try to rearrange the terms, we get m is equals to two times alpha g m square by two r uh, by v square, average of v square. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is it. Uh, oh yeah, uh, m and m here. So the m remains. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, so you can calculate the uh, mass of the cluster. It's nothing but the average uh, square. Uh, you know. The average value of velocity square times R H by alpha times G, and uh, it's also interesting that using virial theorem we can actually calculate the mass of the clusters and to see that its applicability can also be used in terms of the self gravitating objects that are present in the universe, and uh, yeah. So to apply this, uh, we see that in the case of chroma clusters. So we are all of this, all of these equations we have taken that uh, in the case of the chroma cluster, right? So chroma cluster, the uh, redshift that is being observed from uh, Earth uh, to the chroma cluster is about 0.0232. So uh, the distance of the chroma cluster is basically c by Hubble's. This is Hubble's constant, c by h naught times the uh, uh, you know, average redshift that we are observing from this. So you have C is nothing but three into ten to the power eight by Hubble's constant that is uh, seventy-four plus or minus seven. Uh, you know this thing, and uh, you have Z that is zero point two three two. That sums up about uh, ninety-nine megaparsec. So the distance of comma cluster from this thing is about hundred megaparsec. And you have the velocity, which is nothing but uh, you know radial velocity, which is nothing but C times the uh, redshift that is six nine six zero kilometers per second, and then you have the half radius of the uh, coma cluster was calculated to be about one point five mega per second, so that is about four point oh yeah that is about four point six into ten to the power twenty twenty two meters and it's about it's meters and then using these terms we can calculate the mass of the coma cluster. So we have this, we use this equation number 15, if I suppose, yeah. So you have V square times R is by alpha G. And alpha, as I have told, it's about 0 0.4 for the coma cluster. And uh, yeah, we get the mass to be about 2 into 10 to the power 15 m m naught. So this m naught nothing but solar masses, right? So it's uh, 2 into 10, uh, 10 to the power 15 times the mass of our sun. So one interesting thing to note about this value. So all of these, uh, you know, these equations that we have seen has, uh, uh, you know, has resulted in us you know, like getting an average value of the uh, mass of the coma cluster. So, but uh, when we try to individually look at the details, it's less. Uh, so about uh, two percent of uh, of the mass of the coma cluster comes from the stars, and about 10% of of the mass uh, is due to the um, uh, you know the interstellar medium or the inter interstellar gases that are present in this uh, cluster. So combined, uh, uh, you know, so this is basically like way too less than the observed value of the mass of the coma cluster, and the rest of the substance is what we have you know we have tried to be the uh, dark halo or the dark matter that is present in the coma cluster. And one thing to note is that this is not only in the case of coma cluster, but applying the virial theorem to many other galaxies using this uh, relation, we have seen that it is uh, even uh, the mass density was also, you know, not e exactly matching uh, with the uh, masses of the mass, uh, you know, some of the masses of the baryonic matter that we are able to detect. So it was way greater than that. It's about like what, uh, an order of, 10,000 or a lakh was more. So this uh, discrepancy was what led, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, led to the conclusion that there is a lot of uh, dark halo substance or dark matter present in the coma cluster. And the mass to luminosity ratio uh, of the coma cluster was greater than the uh, mass to, uh, you know, luminosity ratio of our own galaxy. So that I think is about uh, 1.5 times greater than the mass to luminosity ratio of our own galaxy. And uh, yeah. 
and the uh, one and the luminosity uh, in the case of luminosity I, as i have said in the previous one when we try to you know transmit the x rays to the galaxy we see uh, we can uh, you know get back the amount of uh, you know the spectral readings of the light that is being reflected i mean absorbed and then uh, transmitted back to our uh, telescope i mean our device, uh, back to earth we can uh, ten, we can see that uh, there is a lot uh, there is a lot of uh, you know light or uh, luminosity from the coma cluster galaxy that is due to the bernstrahlung emission that is uh, due to the uh, as I, I as much as I remember is due to the uh, acceleration of electron that is called free acceleration of free electrons in the uh, you know in the medium that is caused due to protons and uh, helium nuclei that's what i have seen and uh, and the line emission from the highly ionized iron and other heavy metals present in the cluster so uh, then uh, <coughs> excuse so using this uh, using this amount of data that we can get from the x ray analysis of the uh, objects present in the coma cluster we can uh, compute the temperature density and chemical reveal relativity uh, chemical uh, nature of the cluster and there is a coma cluster as about a uh, as a variation of temperatures because the uh, you know the amount of substance is not i mean the luminosity of substances in the cluster is not uniform so we have the coldest region that gave us a reading for about uh, five electron I mean, five electron volt and the uh, warmest of region that gave us about you know nine kilo sorry five kilo electron volt and the uh, warmest of region gave us about Nine kilo electron volt, so we tend to average the uh, temperature of the uh, coma cluster to be about seven kilo electron volt, and that is about the coma cluster. And no, yeah, as I said, like when we tried to apply the virial theorem and to calculate the mass to luminosity uh, ratio of uh, other galaxies that are uh, masses, uh, we can compute the mass and then the luminosity using the X-ray analysis. So we when we try to compute all, uh, all of that and we try to add together. Uh, to the uh, masses of ga you know the variety of galaxies that uh, we have observed so that only the, that only contributes to the density parameter for about 0.2 so this uh, as i have said in the uh, previous lecture research so when we are trying to use the spectral analysis or the x-ray analysis we try to assume that the mass is uh, cons or is a mass is homogeneous uh, as we keep uh, uh, mass keeps getting more and more homogeneous or the homogeneity of the substances present there keeps increasing as we move away from the center of the galaxy so we tend to miss out the intergalactic voids and the mass to, and the density that that arises due to the uh, substances present in the intergalactic voids so this uh, the density parameter of 0.2 that we observed using the virial theorem to calculate the mass and mass of the you know clusters and galaxies and so on so this gives us a lower limit to the density parameter that's about 0.2 so this is to say that the universe should has a density parameter of at least 0.2 so if the universe has as stated in the previous one if the universe has a density parameter to be one it's an exactly yeah. flat universe if it is less than one it's forever it's an it's a forever expanding universe and if it is greater than one, it is it is a contracting universe. It keeps uh, you know it's a contracting universe, and then it will collapse after a certain period of time. So yeah, that is about uh, you know uh, dark matter in coma clusters. And if you guys have any doubts or didn't understand any part, you can ask before I go into the uh, next topic that is the gravitational lensing. Uh, okay, so moving on, uh, let's uh, uh, move on to the next aspect of our topic, that is the gravitational lensing. So yeah, uh, <clears throat> gravitational lensing again. The one way to detect dark matter or to understand, uh, to uh, you know, get to know about their presence in our universe is to look at its gravitational uh, effects on the objects that is around it, as it does not emit or you know absorb any sort of em waves that we have seen so it is really hard to detect them i like to see them so the only way to know that they are present in such and such spots is to look at the gravitational effects that it has that it uh, has over the uh, objects that are surrounding it in the in a certain radius so this is this uh, image is 
<clears throat> a picture is a uh, you know a representation of how light or photons when it passes through uh, you know set, uh, dark, uh, set, through dark matter uh, such as like neutron stars or brown dwarfs and so on such heavily dense and compact objects when it passes through that it just sort of you know the photons just sort of bend in with such with a certain angle so the angle is the or the uh, bending angle is given given by alpha and the b b is the impact parameter so as <coughs> impact parameter is like the closest distance from you know the perpe closest perpendicular distance from the initial point to the spreading point so yeah m is again the mass of the object that is present around i mean or the mass of the dark matter that is present in this place so this is the trajectory of the photon when it passes in it is in the vicinity of a dark matter when it's passing through the vicinity of the dark matter so it tries to it gets deflected by an angle of alpha so again this was an essential observation as it also gave us a sort of uh, you know it also helped einstein really prove observe like in, uh, really prove his uh, theory of general relativity as we know that the famous gravitational lensing uh, this thing, the part where during a solar eclipse, uh, he charted he, uh, six months before the solar calculated solar eclipse, he had uh, noted down the position of the stars near our sun. And then after the solar eclipse, when he again observed, when people observed the uh, position of the stars, it was shifted, you know, because it is not only because of their relative motion, but also due to the gravitational lensing effect that we are seeing. So the image was actually sort of distorted because of, uh, you know, Einstein had uh, accurately calculated that at this point during solar eclipse, the stars will be visible in this, this region due, uh, I mean, when observed through a telescope. So this was due to the uh, gravitational lensing effect that Einstein had uh, predicted using his general theory of relativity. So from Einstein's general theory of relativity, so yeah, and uh, we generally refer to objects that could be, you know, could be considered as dark matter to be machos, or M-A-C-H-O, yeah. that is, uh, <coughs> sorry, massively compact uh, halo objects. So that is the sort of, you know, uh, abbreviation of uh, macho. So, uh, if a photon passes uh, such a compact massive object <coughs> at an impact parameter b, so the local curvature of space-time will call, cause the photon to be deflected by an angle that Einstein had, uh, Einstein had you know, formulated, that is alpha is equal to 4 g m by c squared b. Again, g is the universal gravitational constant, m is the mass of the, <coughs> mass of the uh, macho that is present here. And then four is the constant and C is the speed of light and B is the impact parameter. So, and then if the match is exactly along, so again, uh, as uh, already I have, I have already said that when you try to observe an object or say a galaxy, it, you should always keep in mind that you should also calculate the angle at which you're observing the galaxy. You could be observing the galaxy face on or on the edge on uh, part. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, so uh, say the photon that is coming from uh, that's uh, uh, coming uh, towards us from the said observed uh, said observed object so we need to also calculate uh, see that whether it is in in our line of sight or it is in a different direction so if the photons uh, that are uh, ex that are uh, you know being uh, incident from the object to us and say there is a uh, macho object that is present in between ex at exactly half the distance from the galaxy to the observer. So uh, we can say that the <coughs> angular radius or theta that is given, so the angular radius of the image that is produced due to gravitational lensing effect is about 4 g m by c square b into 1 minus x by x, uh, square root of the whole, like the power 1 by 2. So x is again the distance from the source to the observer. So one minus uh, x, sorry, x is not a distance. Um, so <coughs> yeah. So x is, uh, sorry, xd or uh, x is uh, just a value from uh, which ranges from zero to one. So it is the uh, distance from the observer to the lensing much. So not exactly from the observer to the uh, said uh, observed, uh, the, observed quantity or the observed object it is from the observer to the uh, macho object the distance between the observer and the macho object 
So this is about the uh, angular uh, radius of the image that is produced. And if it is exactly in the line, line of sight, then you get a perfectly ring shaped, uh, you know, lensed uh, image. So, but if it is, if, if you, if you're not uh, viewing it, you know, head on or in, in the, or if the photons are not directly like, uh, you know, in your line of sight, you see that the, uh, the, uh, you know, the lens, the lensing effect does not exactly form a, a ring shaped, uh, you know, distortion. It forms like two or three arcs separately. And then you have to use the, uh, you know, spare, you know, the observational corrections to get the perfect uh, angle of uh, angular radius of the image produced. So yeah, and this was also very essential uh, to note, uh, you know, to understand like at what points you can have, you can predict that the, the, the dark matter exists using the gravitational lensing effect. And uh, the, the, and the lensing effect usually lasts for about, uh, you know, 70 to 80 days uh, from, uh, you know, in the case of coma, the light coming from the coma cluster at such a distance. So using the time period of, uh, you know, said uh, gravity, you know, of uh, these gravitationally lensed, uh, uh, you know, photons. So using the time period, we can actually calculate the distance of the galaxy and also the uh, uh, distance of the galaxy, uh, the observed object. And you can also know uh, about uh, the velocity of the radial velocity of the object. So using this also, we can try to un get to know about, you know, more about the galaxy uh, or the object which we are observing. And also gravitational lensing is also, uh, you know, was accidentally uh, used by, uh, you know, predicting the location of Uranus uh, because when they were observing Neptune, they found uh, that the influx was, uh, you know, varying at some points due to the, you know, since uranium was there, gee, sorry, but Uranus was there right in between the uh, observer and the object. So that is about, yeah, gravitational lensing and uh, yeah, <coughs> excuse me, uh, give me one second, I just go grab some water. Uh, yeah, and I'm back. So I'll start to come. And yeah, so and uh, and mind you that uh, gravitational lensing is not exactly a very common event that one can observe in their, you know, or one an astronomer can observe in their day-to-day uh, -day lives. And they are very rare events. Like when you consider like a large Magellanic cloud, and then you have a macho, uh, like a macho object present in between. So then. It, only the probability of you observing a gravitational uh, observing gravitational lensing is about uh, uh, close to uh, five into ten to the power minus six. Yeah, so that that that's how rare you can observe a gravitational uh, gravitationally lensed uh, you know photon fracca that's incident from such a huge object such as large Magellanic clouds and clusters and so on. So this, and again, so this also was proved to be very challenging for the astronomers to, you know, uh, detect uh, the presence of dark matter in certain places as these events are very rare and they do not occur as much because again, there is also the problem of the uh, line of sight and there are other factors due to which gravitational lensing can also occur. And there are, and one more thing is that there are not, you know, brown dwarfs or neutrons so that they are not very common uh, you know, in a galaxy, you have way more act, like active stars and may, which fall under the main sequence and so on. So it is very rare to observe such events and you'd have to have such a huge amount of, you know, huge mass density for you to actually deflect the photons from its original path to get a gravitationally lensed image of the object that you're observing. Um, yeah. Now that we, uh, and yeah, this is uh, actually the concluding point or the uh, part of the whole thing. So if you would have noticed that I actually talked only about the ways to observe or to detect dark matter that is present in 
you know, say galaxies or clusters or in our own gal in in certain uh, so like in our solar system and so. On. But uh, I didn't actually give a definite description of what actually dark matter is or what it could be and why are we so bothered about it. So basically, dark matter is something that uh, you know it is very faint in terms of observational aspects like it is very hard to detect them and they aren't uh, you know uh, they don't detect with uh, you know electromagnetic waves and they only interact with objects that are nearby it using uh, you know because due to its uh, gravitational effect uh, on the objects that are beside it and so <clears throat> Now that uh, we have seen, uh, now that uh, I had uh, already told you about that, the amount of uh, variant, uh, sorry, the from the coma cluster, uh, we see that only uh, from the coma cluster, and since we are applying virial theorem to various other galaxies, only uh, the density parameter has a lower limit of up to 0 0.2, considering the dark matter that is present. So, but what uh, from the baryonic uh, data or from the density parameter of the baryonic uh, matter that is present we just get to about 0 0.04 as i have discussed in the previous section so that is again insultingly low for us to again uh, say that uh, no the universe is not completely made up of baryonic matter so it is made up of a matter that is uh, not readily visible to us, but we need to use uh, method, you know, your incidences such as gravitational lensing and so on to uh, perfectly, you know, to uh, understand the presence and to know that universe is not completely made up of baryonic matter. So what exactly is, uh, you know, con con is considered as a dark matter? So uh, dark matter and one more thing that is more prevalent is one of the dark matter we know that actually exists, like one of the like, uh, potential candidate for dark matter that we know that act, that we know it exists is a neutrino, right? So a neutrino is basically also again it's a very faint object. I mean it's a very faint object in terms of detection and observation, and it has some mass associated with it. But again, we don't know the exact uh, you know the exact. Uh, measurement of a mass of a neutrino but we do know the change in the mass when the neutrino oscillates from one flavor to another flavor so you have um, you, uh, what do you say tau and the muon neutrino tau neutrino and electron neutrino so the one that is readily uh, you know the one that is available uh, uh, that uh, that we have uh, observed is the electron neutrino that was that is being ejected from the sun to in, like towards earth and uh, when it oscillates from the electron towards like say the tau uh, neutri tau flavor of neutrino so we know the mass difference uh, the uh, you know exactly how much different uh, the mass difference uh, there is that it's that uh, the neutrino has gone through while os uh, oscillating from one flavor to another but we don't know the individual masses of each flavor of the neutrinos but using certain uh, using this again using the certain calculations and uh, you know uh, trying to understand like using the virial theorem okay so when we try to consider uh, you know calculate the exact mass of uh, Neutrino is again not possible. So the difference in the masses is about say four uh, uh, electron. Uh, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's about uh, yeah, it's about four electron uh, volts. And uh, so if we say that the oscillation one uh, one neutrino to another, you know, say from uh, muon to tau and then tau to electron and electron to muon again. So if we say if we consider that each of these uh, oscillatory uh, mass changes is a almost equal to say four electron volts then again it would still not be enough to uh, again the num uh, the number of number density of neutrinos can be calculated from uh, the said uh, cosmic new uh, cosmic neutrino uh, background because neutrinos have existed uh, as long as photons have existed or even before they have existed as to as what uh, big bang theory says so uh, using the data from neutrino background we can calculate the exact number density of the neutrinos that is about 311 of the number number density of the photons that is present in the universe so uh, using this and we can calculate uh, you know the uh, energy of the neutrino and energy you know energy value that is e uh, c comma 0 or e n comma 0 in this case and then we, when we calculate the density parameter it still didn't sum up to you know point uh, Four. 
so we we for a fact know that neutrinos are not only are the only sort of dark matter that is present so we have various other non baryonic matter that is present which can which is also very faint to detect and is not readily observable but we need to uh, use uh, you know certain methods such as gravitational lensing and to observe uh, the presence of dark matter in various other clusters or galaxies using uh, by calculating the radial velocities of the objects that are present at the edge of the galaxies or the clusters and uh, so on and uh, yeah so and the neutrinos as we have seen it wind so we have macho's wimps and, so, and what not no so there are way uh, way, uh, way more number of uh, dark, dark matter candidates that are present that we have not yet understood or known but it is the because of this dark matter only we see that many in many galaxies and so on if if dark matter was not present so in the case of coma cluster we have seen the radial velocity would be so high that uh, there would no be there would uh, the gravitational anchor would have been missing for, and it would have just the particles or the uh, the of uh, the stars that are present would have flung would have been flung across the whole universe greater than uh, the hubble time itself so uh, this again would be an anomaly for us uh, because considering the theory of general relativity and hubble's law nothing can go faster than you know <clears throat> uh, or nothing can be beyond the hubble's distance from which we can, we can observe but we do observe this and if it wasn't for dark matter again it would have been flung you know fast uh, and it would have been, uh, it would be way beyond our uh, observable uh, you know distance so gravitation uh, sorry, uh, the dark matter is what is keeping all of these objects into you know by using uh, the phenomena the gravitational anchor and it is acting as a gravitational anchor to keep the stars within the reach of the you know the galaxy or the cluster and not being just flung into the space and yes so that is about dark matter uh, yeah so i would like to end my talk here and if you have any doubts you can ask but if you want to add on this thing you can also do so